Good evening, everyone. It's 7.06, and I'm going to open this meeting of the Board of Education of Glendora Unified School District. I'm going to actually reconvene the meeting from closed session with no reportable action. And I would like a roll call, please, from Ms. Cornelius. Good evening. Roll call. Board member Reuter. Present. Board clerk Lopez. Here. Board member Merkley. I'm here. Vice President Garcia. Here. And President Clifford. Present. Thank you. Thank you, all present and accounted for. <coughs> Ms. Martinez, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, yes. please? Please stand and place your right hand on your heart. Uh, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Gwen. I'd like to ad adopt the agenda tonight. Is there any questions, changes, or comments from the board? I move we adopt the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. We will move forward with the agenda. We're going to move on uh, to welcome and introduction, and we will go to our superintendent for the next item 37, which is a board recognition. Yes, I would invite Mr. Osborne to introduce our new director of fiscal services, Mr. Osborne. Thank you, Dr. DeGrazia. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Mrs. Araceli Medina, our new Director of Fiscal Services. Mrs. Medina brings a wealth of expertise in fiscal management and educational finance. Her background includes roles as Assistant Director of Fiscal Services, as well as several other um, positions, including payroll, oversight of special education funding, nutrition services funding. Uh, she has a wealth of experience. Ms. Medina holds a bachelor's degree in accounting and is celebrated for her collaborative spirit and dedication to the, her previous district. Her arrival marks a significant addition to an already stellar business team. I'd like to express my gratitude to the 14 panel members, including union leadership, GUSD staff, and outside experts who participated in the extensive interview process. All of them contributed to this hiring process. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Medina to our community. We look forward to the positive impact she's gonna make. if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. So um, good evening, esteemed board members, um, Dr. DeGrazia and cabinet members and colleagues and distinguished community members. Um, my name is Araceli Medina and I am the new director of fiscal services and I wanna start off by expressing how grateful and blessed I feel to have been given this opportunity um, to join the Glendora team and um, be in this role of director of fiscal services. I also want to start off by acknowledging my family that is here with me. The last time I had to do this, I got really nervous and I forgot to thank my husband. And so I want to start off with that this, this evening. And um, I want to thank my husband, Horacio, who is here with me today. Um, he is incredibly supportive and through this whole interview process, he was pumping me up and um, I really, really appreciated that. And then I have my two boys with, with me here today. I have Isaac, who is 16. Um, he goes to South Hills High School and Ryder Medina, um, who is at Ben Lomond Elementary. And then I have my sister, Jessica, and my nephew, um, Sebastian, and my parents, Julio and Celia, that are here with me today. Um, I do want to say a couple words in Spanish, you know, um, to thank my parents that are here with me. Um, Mom, Dad, um, gracias por el sacrificio que hicieron en dejando su país y vinieron hace 37 años. Para darnos una mejor vida y educación. Quiero que se sientan orgullosos del esfuerzo y trabajo que hicieron conmigo y con Jesse. Um, ustedes plantaron una semilla y de ahí creció un árbol. Esta relación es parte de todos los sacrificios y esfuerzo que nos enseñaron. So, gracias. Los amo. Um, so Eric, you know, talked about my um, um, career background, so I just want to share a little bit about myself. I um, grew up in Azusa, so I, I'm local. Um, if you guys have been to La Tolteca, that was my first job. I know, yeah. <laughs> my parents actually worked there. My sister does as well. 
Um, so when we have any future potlucks, um, you guys will have a lot of Bolteca food. <laughs> um, I went to Gladstone High School and um, it was there in an ROP class that I took accounting and it was my first um, experience with a, you know accounting and where math was always a, a, a strong suit of mine so um, you know it was um, and I loved it so it made sense that accounting was something that also you know I fell in love with um, there's like you know it all balances out there's a solution you know so I'm, I'm a numbers gal um, I started off my career in education in about 2010. I started off in a child development program. And at that time, I started going back to school, and that's where I got my, my bachelor's in accounting. And then I spent the last eight years at Covina Valley, um, where um, I started off in payroll and kind of worked myself up, um, oversaw the Fund 13 budget, which is the cafeteria fund. And then as my last role as assistant director, I oversaw the special education budget, adult education, um, child development, all our school site budgets. Um, so I look really forward to, you know, getting to know um, Glendora Unify, getting out there and, you know, meeting all the departments and um, principals and just, you know, being able to support the district um, with providing good fiscal data. And pr um, I'm so happy to be joining Jeanette. She's been great. The whole team has been really wonderful and welcoming. Um, and so I look forward to the future and um, to supporting Jeanette and um, with uh, continuing to um, help the district remain financially stable. So um, I thank you for the opportunity and that will be all for me today. <laughs> and I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Jeanette, do you want to take a picture with your with them? Yes, you should go, Jeanette. Yes, you should. Thank you again and welcome. The next item is public comment. We really anticipate and look forward to hearing from you. We require that you fill out one of these beautiful little cards. I have one of them, so I'll be calling one person up. That one person actually looks like two. It's the one and only Maggie, Lara, and Joe Cena. If you could please come forward, this is your three minutes of fame. Thank you. Good evening. Um, as Gary shared, my name is Maggie Lahr, and I'm the executive director for the Glendora Public Library Friends Foundation. It is a joy and a pleasure to be among so many friends and community partners. Um, the library works very closely with the school district, and our foundation works very closely with the Glendora Ed Foundation um, in making and supporting the families and the children that we serve. Um, we look forward to uh, partnering and all the different activities and so we're here actually in celebration one of those activities which is our great trivia challenge which is one of our foundation's um, fundraisers that we hold every year and includes teams that represent different groups and businesses and they compete by answering a series of increasingly difficult trivia questions. Well, this year, we, we had a ringer team from the Glendora Unified School District who claimed the trivia uh, champion crown this year. And part of that celebration, I'll have Joe continue in speaking about the team members themselves. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you again for allowing us to speak tonight. Um, the district has three great team, team members. Had um, um, Ms. Wilson, Director of Student and Family Support <laughs> Services, and had Mrs. Trent, Principal of Sellers, and then Mr. Zernikow, Zer hopefully I'm pr pronouncing that right, the Assistant Principal of Goddard. Now, it was a tough competition, and there was a lot of 
um, rounds. They came in first, and so they got their gold medal. But they also, the surprise to everybody, they got to hoy, or hold the inaugural <laughs> Great Trivia Challenge wrestling belt nice. modeled after Hulk Hogan, 1980-something. And so, and there's, there's Instagram pictures on of you holding it. And um, I just wanted to wear it during the presentation pretty soon, so that's when we brought it. You know, you know, if you want to come hold it up, she had it, you had it, like on their shoulder like this. And so, um, so we just wanted to have you touch it one more time and then welcome you back to defend your championship next year. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I have no further cards, so I will close public comment and get back to our agenda. Thank you very much. Joe, that belt can't leave the building, right? It stays right here. There you go. Okay. Uh, we have our next item, 4.1, is our student board member report. Ms. Martinez? Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. So, starting off with LaFetra Elementary, we celebrated Read Across America this week at LaFetra for the last week of March, uh, the 4th through the 8th. We had mystery readers, teacher reading swap, dress up days, and a fun week for everyone. We had our second parent teacher conference week. This was a wonderful week for teachers and parents to meet. Our PTA was also very generous with donating meals to our teachers. Walk through California was an amazing on campus field trip for our fourth graders. They dressed up and had fun participating in an engaging hands on adventure. The fourth and fifth grade choir students participated in the Rotary Choir Festival. It was an outstanding performance by all students. Our students participated in a Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory talent show. From dancing and pen flipping to singing, our talented students showcased their skills. Next from Sellers Elementary. We celebrated Book Week at Sellers the week of February 26th through March 1st. We had a lot of literature based activities each day. We did some buddy reading, a teacher read around, and community partners came to read to our students. It was a fun week for everyone. Our PTA hosted a family pizza night on March 8th in our cafeteria. It was a fun time for families to come out and enjoy visiting each other e with each other's families. Our sellers PTA rocks. We held our second trimester Viking Awards Assembly on February 23rd. Lots of students were recognized for their academic achievements, as well as their ability to be Viking strong, and strong is in all caps. Our second round of parent-teacher conference was a success. We had a great turnout and teachers were happy with the results. We look forward to state testing starting in April. We are going to be looking at fun ways to get our students excited about testing and rock that test. From Goddard Middle School, Student recognition lunch was held last week, and teachers again recognized and celebrated our star students with certificates and a lunch. Another 30 students and staffs were recognized with a Goddard Way opportunity prize drawing, drawing, prize drawing prizes for upholding the Goddard Way virtues. We continue to recognize perfect attendance for each month with certificates and prizes. MOCA Japan uh, registration and payment information was presented to parents last week. Parents will have until March 15th to submit online registration and either a deposit or a full payment. Our students voted for this year's promotion dance themed and selected Willy Wonka's Factory. Our PTA is already busy planning this amazing promotion dance for our eighth graders. Open House is on March 21st and our book fair is also during the week of Open House. Parents and students will have a chance to visit the book fair um, during open house as well. On open house day, counselors will be hosting a parent night from 5.30 to 6 p.m. in our gym, covering the following topics. Tips to help your student finish strong and information on adolescent stress management and mental health. We are also planning to get ready for state testing, which will start in April. Our students will get ready to crush the, crush the CASP. Thank you. Uh, from Whitcomb, our annual college and career day was on March 6th. There were nine presenters, including the fire department, LAPD, the U.S. Army, nursing and ultrasound tech, 
Um, the students enjoyed learning about different careers and considering options for the future. The principal held a student advisory meeting to discuss various topics, including safety, attendance, teaching, and learning, um, equality, equity, inclusion, and diversity. And it was great for our students to give feedback and for Ms. Shavada to hear from the students. Overall, students really enjoy their classes and teachers. However, they want to have more clubs on campus and more athletic activities. New student orientation for fourth quarter will be held on Thursday, March 7th. All new students and parents are required to attend orientation to hear about our program and how we still help our students recover credits. It also gives parents and students the opportunity to ask questions and voice their concerns. Approximately seven new students will start at Whitcomb for the fourth quarter. We will have our third recognition brunch on Thursday, March 21st. We will be recognizing our third quarter students who are on the honor roll, student of the month and perfect attendance. Parents, district leadership, and community members are invited to this event. We appreciate all the support from our community in making these quarterly events possible. The leadership class is planning our prom to be held on March 29th at the Glendora Country Club. The theme for this year is Back to the 80s. Our community members have been very generous in donating funds to sponsor needy students to attend prom. Citrus College is also providing free hair and makeup to those students and Glendora Gives will have a dress drive soon where students can choose prom dresses for free. Our state testing will be coming up in April. Teachers are preparing students by taking practice tests and getting students familiar with the testing website. And that is all for me, thank you. Very good, how about Friday night? I didn't hear anything about your activities on Friday night. I, I also was at the trivia challenge and it was a blast. It was, I had an amazing time, it was so fun. I went to see my boyfriend who got out in the third round. <laughs> so. What, what happened after he was pummeled in the third round? What happened? You joined the winning team, right? I, I, I yeah. <laughs> then I, after that, I was there for the district team. So, <laughs> yeah. I love, I love that loyalty. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next item is comments from the Board of Education. I will start to my right tonight with... Uh, Ms. Merkley. Okay, well, as I mentioned last time, I left the morning after to go spend time with my daughter, and I got back Saturday morning. But today, I went to Stanton. Remember our last board meeting? You're talking about Eagle time, and so I got to go in and observe the um, just the fourth, third, third through fifth grade, and it was amazing. And I spent some time talking to Mrs. Galinda. Galindo, Galindo was... It was so informative. I really enjoyed it. She said they're, they see their test scores rising already. So I am excited to see this program, and perhaps our other schools can do it. I mean, it, it, was, it was good. And looking at the teachers and watching them, I was really amazed. Um, I was really sad to miss the reading across the America. That's my favorite thing is to go read to kids. But... Maybe when I'm here, I'll call and say, find someone I can read to. Anyway, um, I'm going back to Utah tomorrow to be with my daughter. She is due in about four weeks, and it's kind of miserable, but, <laughs> but so cute. So, anyway, so thanks. We'll see. Okay. It was definitely, as I was making my list of the last two weeks, a very busy week for me, so I cannot even imagine the amount of work our site principals are having to do, our administrators, our Dr. DeGrazia, I, my hat's off to all of you because there is a lot going on in the last few months, um, before last couple months before school ends, so thank you for all that you do to arrange for all these, not just academic things that are going on, but also the fun. Um, it's really nice to see it happening. I did get to go to two of the schools to do reading, and I got to read in your grandson's classroom. Yeah. TK kindergarten class, and that was so much fun. I mean, it was hard. They couldn't really get their attention. I'm not a teacher. I'm just a mom, and so I parent in a more like sit down or listen. So you can't do that in the classroom. Uh, but they were so adorable, and um, I, I, I didn't need them to listen to me. I just wanted to sit there and watch them do their thing, which was, I walked in while they were having snack, and that was fun. <laughs> um, so thank you for allowing us to come in, and, and, and I 
think it's such a special way for the community to get involved and come in and see the classroom. So I'm grateful to be a part of that. Um, Rotary Choral Festival. Ugh. I went as wearing two hats as a Rotarian myself and as a board member, I was able to check in everybody in with my little handy dandy phone, which is the first time I've ever done that. And it was great to be able to see every single person that walked into that room. So I'm, I'm happy that I got to do that. But the Choral Festival itself was phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, I keep um, telling community members, you really don't need to leave and go to the Pantages Theater. There's so much going on here in our own city between, you know, at Citrus College, here at the Little Theater, so many things at a very affordable uh prize for the family and it's very entertaining and you're supporting our schools so I highly encourage you I, I wish there was a site where we could just click and see what's going on uh, as far as the the arts um, so that it's easily accessible for our student our family members to see what can we do this Friday we don't have any plans um, I know downtown is happening but you know there's other things going on sorry Joe that was not <laughs> um, I did get an opportunity to go to the women's leadership conference um, put together by Lake Co. As a Latina in um, this new realm for me of education and leadership up here as, as a board member, it was uh, so incredible to be a part and be in that room with so many amazing women. Two, um, three other uh, staff members were able to join and that was so much fun. I got to chat with them and get to know them a little bit more. Um, again, if any of our staff get an opportunity to attend that, Next year, I highly encourage it because there was a lot to learn. Um, a lot of good, um, uh, key, the keynote speaker was phenomenal. She's doing a study on menopause. I may sign up. Um, orchestra festival, the Tartan festival. I see there's so much going on. And I know you probably know about all this, but I just want to remind you all that there's so many ways to get involved. So many organizations in our community that are helping our school in their little way. The Rotary, um, GF and and all these Kiwanis. I mean, it's I, I did the crop hunger walk with United Methodist, which also helped our uh, Spartan Garden. And speaking of the Spartan Garden, one of the stops during this crop walk, uh, crop hunger walk, was at the garden, which was great to see some of our staff members there. But more importantly, our nutrition services served us a delicious caprese salad. I mean, guys, it was amazing. And so I would have walked again just to get another scoop of that salad. It was really good. So again, there's a lot going on, a lot of ways to support our schools. Um, and, and if you ever, if you don't know, if you're not sure how you can support, um, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to give you some recommendations as I'm sure anyone sitting here can uh, also guide you in that direction. Um, what else do I have? I'm gonna wrap it up because I said a lot, but thank you. Thank you for being here. I have a room, a full room today. Well, Monica, I live the life of a high school principal, yeah. so I know how busy it is. And so I haven't been in Glendora much, so I've been down in Fountain Valley where we, we have a lot going on too. But anyways, um, no, I know there's a lot going on and Glendora always does it well, um, from elementary to middle to high, always. And so as far as um, America Sings with Rotary, I did that when I was in elementary school. So I actually participated in that event a long time ago. So I know how well done it is and um, a lot of great things happening in Glendora and it's gonna roll through here to the end of the year to graduation. So it should be a lot of fun for people. Thank you very much. Um, jumping on the bandwagon of how much I enjoyed being invited to the Read Across America events. Um, I highly recommend putting your name on whatever list you need to get onto for next year because nothing quite fills your cup like getting into the classroom and um, being with the students and um, enjoying uh, their time. And the questions that you get can be very interesting from those elementary kids. Um, but I um, have been to a few classrooms and one of my classrooms that I went to was Miss Speed's class at um, Stanton. And I got the most unbelievable set of hand-drawn thank you notes that if I'm ever having a bad day, I'm going to refer to this little um, cache of thank you notes here because these are some real pick-me-ups. Um, really, really enjoyed my time there. Uh, this morning, I attended um, the uh, San Gabriel Valley ROP. We had a board meeting this morning. 
And um, their director of ed services, uh, Ms. Hernandez, has been making the rounds um, with our other member districts to give the pathway audit presentations. So Dr. DeGrazia and I attended a meeting a few months ago now um, where they, um, they audited all the pathways and all the different districts to talk about what schools have, how many of them have the intro courses, how many of them have the um, completer courses, how many kids get through them, how many we send to our regional, local, or local, regional and state competitions, that sort of information that I think is very in informative um, for boards and not only to see what's going on in your district and be able to have conversation amongst ourselves as far as our ROP offerings are concerned about what our neighboring districts are also doing as far as um, how that, um, how our choices are impacting our students in as so far as what they're able to do with that upon graduation. Like, are there jobs available in the sectors that we have technical education pathways for at our schools? And the good news for Glendora is yes, but I think you guys might like to hear it for yourselves. So I don't know what the board meeting schedule looks like for the whole rest of the year as far as spaces for presentations are concerned. But um, if there is another board member here that might agree with me here so that there are two of us that would be interested in having our pathway audit and in talking with um, Dr. Downing and um, Ms. Hernandez, then um, it's something that I would recommend that we do. I thought you might. So if we could um, find uh, find some time to do that and give us all just the opportunity to dig a little bit further into ROP and our continuing education pathways. That's all for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I won't be repetitive, but there's... Oh. Sorry, I have something to add. I forgot to mention in the Wickham report that our leadership class recently took a trip to Shepherd's Pantry, and we're going to take another one this Wednesday for the rest of our group, and it was just... A wonderful, wonderful time. I I had a blast. Um, it, it's it's nice to just know that you're helping people, and there's so many wonderful people working there. So I highly implore anyone if you're free on a Wednesday or Thursday at four forty five, if you show up, they will tell you to do stuff, and it's very fun. And it was a great <laughs> class trip. So that was it. Sorry, thank you. Yes, that's one of our good community gifts we have. And they serve a lot of Glendorans that you'd be surprised when you go there. So thank you for that acknowledgement. Yeah, they, the regional, but our scope is Glendora, so we're grateful for that. Um, community read-ins, I, I, I ran into one of my peers at one of the schools. I, I want to say that uh, uh, I have a busy schedule, but there's nothing better than stopping at one of our elementary schools in the morning to read books. And I had the pleasure of going to Sutherland School uh, to Mrs. Marcos's class. And uh, because of my last name, I always have a Clifford book with me. <laughs> and then I have another book. <clears throat> so I, I, I was able to read the book called Mother Bruce, which is an awesome book. Um, it, I read to the fourth graders and uh, the, the staff was, was, it was just a great day. And the kids were so happy. Uh, they went home and thank you notes, parent contacts. So it was a phenomenal time at Sutherland. And then I had another opportunity at uh, Stanton, uh, uh, Miss Galindo's uh, arena, and I was able to read to Miss Armijo's class, a third grade class, and I read a book that was actually very interesting. It was The Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors, which was a fun book to read, and I also had a Clifford book there. Um, and uh, what was more rewarding about that is that out in the community later, a couple of her class uh, uh, were actually remembered who I was, went home and told their parents about it. And like you said, they had so many questions about what I did in the past, Glendora. And, and then I met him at an event on Friday night, and he wanted me to autograph his forehead. And I said, no, that's okay, but thank you. I don't want to do that just in case. <clears throat> but it was just very rewarding. Um, did anyone ask you how old you are? <laughs> I got asked how old I am. That was a real special You know, I just, I just want to tell the community, that's open to the community. It's called a community reading, I believe. And uh, it, it, it was absolute fun and didn't take that much of my time. I did it on the way to work. But in addition to that, as, as uh, Trustee Garcia said, there were many, a lot of other events. I, was a, I met with the city manager, the police chief, the superintendent, a few parents, a lot of things going on. 
Uh, for those that didn't know, and I'm sure most of you do, it was opening baseball day for the Lassie League and the Little League. So we were up at the Goddard Fields and fully packed with Glendorans from T-Ball all the way through. I think it's Pony up there in that one field. And uh, one of my grandchildren was playing on the T-Ball. Phenomenal fun. And it's just good to see the new generation of Glendora parents with the kids. Uh, you know, my kids were there coaching their kids and I could see their friends. It was a rewarding time to be up there and see the new generation of Glendorans uh, on the district's beautiful field property playing ball. It was, it was a lot of fun. And um, so on Friday night, I had to make the choice. Do I go to the GHS choir or do I go to the great trivia challenge? So we kind of divvied up the duty and we were able to make all of it. But it's certainly a pleasure here to serve the Glendorans and uh, to be involved with our schools. It's a real blessing and one that I don't take for granted and I really appreciate and welcome to this great school district. I think it's an upgrade from your previous job. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay. That's Covina. I can take it. Uh, okay, the next item we are going to move right on to my right to our superintendent who probably has a few gems of wisdom for us this evening. Maybe a couple. Uh, today actually marks the beginning of the fourth and final quarter of the school year. Yes, <laughs> attendance is important as ever. Incentives are happening at sites and we're imploring everybody to finish strong with attendance. We started really well. We've taken a little dip recently to about 95% district-wide, but if we can get back up to 96 and finish strong, that would be really, really good. Only three weeks remain until spring breaks. So really important three weeks, finish strong into the spring break and then come back and there's really not much left to do. Uh, we are uh, really wanted to stress the importance of our continued collaboration with the Glendora Education Foundation, GUSD and GEF, are thrilled to announce a transformative shift in our STEAM lab focus. This exciting new plan involves the establishment of dedicated STEAM labs, brick and mortar, at each of our TK through eight schools, starting with Lafaytra Elementary. It's under construction right now. Uh, they're breaking that down and making it into a STEAM lab. That will happen soon, prior to the Glendora Ed Foundation's event, fundraiser Food for Thought on April 19th. The primary goal of this initiative is to provide students with the continuous access to these innovative and artistic learning environments and additional opportunities for hands-on experience in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, STEAM. This is designed to empower students, allowing them to fully immerse themselves in the realms of STEAM education, nurturing creative and innovative mindsets. So a big announcement and a big focus and a big goal and our anticipation is that we will have all the elementary STEAM labs, brick and mortar, complete by December 2024 and 2025 for both of the middle schools. So we'll move quickly into that, and, and we are working on those, uh, again, right now with LaFatria. We're excited about that. Again, their annual Food for Thought, the Foundations, is Friday, April 19th. So we look forward to that. Moving to, there are certainly state budget concerns. Um, they'll be referenced in the presentation tonight in the second interim. They're, they're to be, we're to be made aware of them for sure. Greater deficit than anticipated. And we're monitoring our revenues and each of our expenses very closely. Our second interim report that you'll hear tonight from Ms. Walzak will note our need to plan accordingly in the coming months and coming years. Some information about the Cal Kids program. Cal Kids is a state program that provides eligible low and moderate income students with up to $1,500 and newborn babies with up to $175 in an account for future higher education expenses. Only approximately 10% of the eligible students have taken and families have taken advantage of this in Glendora Unified to date. 250 to be uh, exact of the more than 250 2,500 eligible. So we will certainly put more information on our website about that, how you can access that, and look for more information in this week's, this Friday's, Glendora Connection, which will come out, will have all the specifics related to the Cal Kids program, and you can check your eligibility or verify it there as such. 
Tomorrow is the first ever Tartan Day at Glendora High School. Eighth graders will be bused to Glendora High School from Goddard and Sandburg Middle Schools for a wonderful day of experience on the high school campus at night. The parents still have their opportunity, and they will come for future Tartan Night at 6.30 p.m., but at 9.30, I look forward to seeing future Tartan Day at Glendora High School. Kudos and congratulations to the championship belt winning trivia team, two-thirds of which is here strong tonight. Yes, get to congratulate them again. And also two really big announcements. Uh, first, if you have not heard, Sandburg Middle School was selected a, as a California Distinguished School for 2024. That is the first such uh, distinction of any school in 15 years for that honor, since 2009. So let's give Sandberg a big round of applause. A lot of hard work, a lot of hard work, persistence, blood, sweat, and tears in closing the achievement gap to be selected for that honor. And finally, and, and both of these honors are like state championships to me. A distinguished school and then this honor. Glendora High School's band in pageantry was nominated by Congresswoman Judy Chu's office to represent the state of California at the National Independence Day Parade in Washington, D.C. on Constitution Avenue in July, on July 4th, 2025, not the upcoming one, a year and a half from now. That is a big, big deal. Most states receive only one representative. California is a little bit larger than most states. We get two, only two representatives. Glendora High School's band in pageantry is one of them. Congratulations, congratulations to them. That's a big, big honor. So thank you. <laughs> and that's all I have, sir. Thank you. I'm sure we're looking forward to some fundraising opportunities yes. for our band and pageantry as we move towards uh, Washington, D.C. Okay, so now that we're done with all that business, we're going to start our staff presentations. The first one is Let's Talk. It's a presentation by Ms. Christy Espino, who's in charge of all things computerized here. <laughs> Christy? Seems like I'm in charge of all things that plug into a wall, <laughs> whether they're computerized or not. Um, so thank you for having me. Good evening, Dr. Grazia, trustees. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to share with you um, something new that we recently launched that's attached to our district website. Um, so you can see on the screens and maybe even on your screen at home if you're watching live um, that we have a new yellow button that says let's talk on our website. Um, that button, when clicked, will take you to a landing page. Um, and that page has some uh, popular quick links that families look for. So our district calendars, um, board meeting information, and school contact information. But it also has several like little tiles or buttons that can be clicked. Um, the magic really is in those buttons. Essentially, this platform, Let's Talk, is intended to be a, um, a communication tool, a way for us to engage and empower our community to be able to provide us with feedback and ask questions. Um, one of our big goals, as you know, as a district and as a school board you've expressed, is um, clearing up communication, creating open pathways, um, making sure that we're really engaging um, our school communities. And so this is one way that we are um, attempting to do this because each one of the categories in our district, everything from business services to educational services, um, if somebody wants to know about extended daycare or if they want to know about how they can be a vendor in our district, there are different categories in these buttons that are color-coded by topic. Um, and when it gets clicked, it takes to a, any of the buttons would take uh, the user to a contact form. So they would identify themselves as a community member or a parent or a student or a staff member um, and then write their comments, their questions, their concerns, whatever they may want to share with us um, and submit that. It then gets routed internally to um, like staff facing pathways. So what that basically means is it creates an email or a notification for the person who's most likely to be able to answer that question. Um, so it automatically gets to the person who is meant to be the receiver of it. So there's no question about who do I reach out to or, you know, is this the right person? Um, it will internally route. And then if that isn't the right person, if maybe the question should have been under a different topic, we have the ability on the back end to then um, tag in other team members so we can work collaboratively as a district team to answer those questions in a really timely fashion. Um, you know, the deadline we've given ourselves is within two business days. 
in the ca cases so far, the ones that I've seen come through, the average resolution time is about five hours. So it's happening within one work day. Um, and this is something that families can access 24 seven. So even though, um, you know, it, we're only going to be responding to them on school, on business days. Um, <laughs> I'm a little guilty of responding outside of business days, but um, but families though, when it's on their mind, whatever time of day it is, can go in and can log their question or their inquiry um, without having to search the website for who or what or where to, to put it. Um, so this will direct that communication. Um, on the back end, one of the really nice things is that it will also help us to kind of track our metrics about how quickly we are responding, what our most common topics are so that we can do things like build out our website with more information or send additional communication regularly about things that are common questions. Um, so it's going to help us in that regard. So really good metrics on the back end. Um, and then also it gives everybody who's had a um, communication point with Let's Talk the opportunity at the end when there's a resolution or closure to that case, an opportunity to rate their experience. So how um, satisfied are they with their interaction? Um, and that helps us also to know um, whether we're hitting the mark when it comes to our customer service as a district. So um, overall, you know, there's, there's a few ways to access it. That yellow button is one. Um, any other page that is visited on the website, um, since that yellow button no longer floats, it pops out as a side tab. So it's a yellow tab that floats on the right-hand side of the page that says, let's talk. And so it will embed um, the form with all of the information. You can drop down the topics. And so it, it, it's wherever the person is on the website. So they, they don't have to remember or go back and look. Um, previous to this, we did have a very basic contact us form um, that was lo um, located in the quick links of the website and that still lives there. So people who are used to going there as a resource, um, it kind of tricks them, but I under the quick links where it says contact us, it still looks the same, but it will bring them to this page instead where they can select their topic. So that way nobody gets lost looking for, you know, how do I get help for whatever I may need. Um, so that's, you know, a basic overview. Some of the things that, that are really helpful with this as well is it's going to meet the needs of um, a lot of our families because it has embedded translation. So there's a toggle at the top of the red Let's Talk box. And so you can choose um, a ton of different languages. Um, but the three that we have programmed right now are Arabic, Mandarin, and Spanish. Because um, the forms do have to be done um, on the back end a bit, you know, to make sure that they, they make sense and they're compatible. Um, but those three are our primary um, second languages for our families. And so we've dedicated th that space for those languages. Um, so those are all things that are, are important to know about Let's Talk. Of course, the reminder is always that face-to-face um, -face communication Phone calls, in-person visits are always preferred. Um, you know, if, if we have that ability to build that relationship and, and to spend the time with a family member or a community member in person, then we love to do those things. But sometimes you just want that quick email. <laughs> and this is a good resource for that. But it should not replace at all, you know, feeling like you can pick up the phone and call or, or, um, or come in and visit in person. Um, we definitely still value those relationships that are that are long-standing success, <laughs> success pathways. Thank you. Any yeah. questions for the board? All right, we appreciate it. All right, thank you. I, I don't have a question, but I do want to say thank you. Thank you for listening uh, to the needs of the community and responding in this way, because I do believe this is going to be a really nice uh, so resource for our parents to just quickly be able to access. I know that's been one of my complaints about it, but I can't find it. So this is great. I mean, I did look at it a few times and I, I find it very useful and easy to use. So thank you for doing that. And um, I would love to hear in a few months and see how it's working and what kind of feedback you're getting. Yeah, yeah. And I would encourage anybody who's kind of hesitant, you know, or wants to practice using it. Um, the very first topic list is just tell us something that we should be proud of. What, you know, what makes you proud to be in GUSD? Something to celebrate. And so um, if you just want to practice submitting something, that would be a great way to practice is to, sh to give a shout out to, you know, your child's teacher or to, um, you know, the, the person who's, um, you know, the crossing guard in front of the elementary school. Um, those, um, those are really great ways. Or maybe it, it is that you attended the Rotary event and you really want to just say that was an, an amazing event. Um, those are some things you can practice the process with so that when you do need to reach out for help, um, you know, it's not your first time. So just a thought. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Our next president. 
Our next presentation is from Sellers Elementary. Presenting, presenting tonight is the principal, Shauna Trent. Well, I, you know, it's kind of heavy, I got to say. Um, but yeah, it's in, the, it's in the super secret vault now, apparently. <laughs> uh, just to advance mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, good evening, Superintendent DeGracia, President Clifford, Board of Trustees and Cabinet members. Um, I cannot believe, uh, like Dr. DeGracia said, we are just in the last like little quarter of our school year. And it's been almost a year that I have been principal at Sellers. And I cannot tell you how proud I am to be a Sellers Viking. I think that I bleed blue and I constantly tell my staff Sellers is the place to be and I, I just feel so fortunate to not only be a part of Sellers but a part of this district and so um, it is with great pride that I share with you just a snapshot of some wonderful things that are happening at, happening at my amazing campus. So um, here we just have a few snapshots of the learning and the fun activities that we've encountered throughout the school year this far. I've been fortunate enough to attend a few off-campus events with students. Um, I went with the fifth graders to the water treatment plant, so I probably know more about the water here in Glendora than I need to know, but it was a really cool field trip. They really enjoyed it. Um, I also got to help with the um, supervision at the Rotary Choral Festival, and that was, that was fun. And we've got some upcoming events that I get to leave campus and be a part of. So um, I'm just, like I said, I'm, I'm really enjoying my time being principal at Sellers and um, getting to know my students and my staff and um, the community members and the families. It, it, it's just truly has been an honor. Here is a snapshot of our enrollment, and this is broken down by subgroups. Our numbers have remained pretty consistent with last year's enrollment numbers. We were fortunate enough at the beginning of the school year to add a TK class, so we have two TK classes total, and that's really helped to keep our enrollment steady with last year's enrollment. Our average class size for kindergarten through third is 24.8, and for 4th and 5th, it's 29.7. We have 21 brick-and-mortar classrooms and 8 portables. Our current enrollment is 556. And in addition to our general education enrollment, we house the ASD program on our campus as well. And that's been really uh, cool to be witness to and to be a part of. It's been nice to kind of be in partnership with the CELPA and get to know um, the, the people from the SELPA that come and work with our ASD classrooms. And I cannot speak highly enough about my ASD teachers. They are amazing. And it's really fun to get in there and to uh, learn right alongside the students on self-regulation and, and things like that. It, it's really, I'm really glad that, um, to be a part of that program on my campus. All right, so then we are going to look at the academic performance for English language arts. Um, based on the 2023 state testing data, 66.6% .6 of our students are meeting standard. All subgroups are in green or blue, which means that all students on average scored above standard. There are no equity gaps. We are still, however, ensuring that we meet the needs of all students through small group instruction and intervention strategies, both in and out of the classroom. And we are especially proud of our students with disabilities who increased 6.8 points from last year. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about our STAR data, which is not on this slide, but um, based on our STAR, our STAR data for ELA, Kindergarten through fifth grade, we have 55% of our students who are proficient in reading, and this is a really good indicator of how our students will perform on the CASP testing once they're um, third through fifth grade. Looking at math, um, we have 57.35% of our students 
at or above standard. And again, we have everyone scoring in the green and blue levels with no huge equity gaps. Our students with disabilities also scored well in math overall. And then I also want to, as a side note, say that we had 43% of our um, fifth grade students score at or above standard on our science test. We, um, looking at our star math data, are actually doing really well. And um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit later about um, our math intervention. And, and I really largely attribute it to this, that we have 77% of our students who are proficient in math right now. Our English learner progress, um, since last January, we have reclassified seven students. We do have a fairly small EL population, so uh, we don't really have an indicator for EL progress when you look at the state test scores because the numbers are based on students uh, first through fifth with two or more years of data. And the majority of our EL students right now are TK, kindergarten, and first grade. Um, but we do have um, everyone who is at a level four and was eligible for reclassification was reclassified. Our current levels right now, we have five students who are at a one, which is minimally developed. We have seven students at a two, which is somewhat developed. We have five students at a three, which is moderately developed. And um, it's amazing to me. I know that there have been several of the young ones, especially, who have come to us with no English language. And to see how far they've progressed, I know we've got one in TK right now who he just talks a mile a minute now. And it's amazing to see how far he's come and how, how much of a sponge they are to come and not have any of the language and just being immersed in the culture to really pick that up. So it, it's, it's been pretty neat to watch. All right, our attendance rate is slowly improving from 2022-2023 to this year. We are in the process of establish, establishing an attendance incentive for our last trimester, so we're hoping to bring the attendance rate up even higher. We have no subgroups in the red and only a few groups falling into the yellow category. So overall, we have a positive attendance rate of around 96%. Our suspension rate, we do have two subgroups in the orange as compared to green. And overall, we are continuing to analyze our student behaviors. We have put a few procedures into place this year and as a staff uh, are really taking a closer look at our discipline procedures. Uh, we're, we are looking at establishing some restorative practices that will help restore students back to class while continuing to hold them accountable. We have a school-wide behavior system that we have put in place. Um, we use blue tickets, and basically, um, to earn a blue ticket, you have to be someone who has been caught being Viking strong. And uh, strong stands for safe, trustworthy, respectful, organized, neighborly, and growth-minded. So anyone on our staff can get a blue or can give a blue ticket to a student who's been caught being Viking strong. And on Fridays, we do a drawing. And so I have been very fortunate to partner with some, some really good businesses in town to get gift cards. And right now, I've got gift cards coming out my ears. I just got some from Jersey Mike's. Um, Monica hooked me up with some Panda Express. I have In-N-Out. I have Chick-fil-A. I have Cane's. Um, and so it's just kind of something that the students look forward to and they work they work towards to, to receive these blue tickets, but um, the ultimate prize every month is lunch with the principal. And I'm honored that they think it's such a big <laughs> deal, but um, we're really hoping that this positive behavior incentive will encourage students to want to do the right thing and to make the right choices so that our suspension rate can continue to, uh, to be in that, that positive green and blue and, and to not have anyone in, um, in the, the orange or yellow categories. All right, so um, 
We knew that when we started this year, we wanted to focus on math and reading intervention. We were very fortunate to receive a math intervention teacher and um, really knew that that was an area that we needed to look at just based on past data. So um, looking at math intervention, our, our math interventionist who is here in the audience with us tonight, Stacy Maisel, has been an amazing addition to our staff. And she's been working with a number sense and fluency with the students, as well as doing some push-in classroom support. She is currently serving around 30 students in a small group math intervention setting and around 40 students in a push-in model. And that's where she pushes into the classroom. And after the teacher has taught the lesson, she gives a little bit of extra support to them based on whatever the lesson has been about. We have seen 89% of math intervention students star scores increase. So um, it's really paying off what we're doing and, and I'm super excited to see the results uh, when it comes to our data next year. In addition to that, we do have an awesome reading interventionist who is here in the audience as well, Cindy Dunaway. She has been working this year on the Spire Phonics program and we're seeing a lot of success with that as well. So we have over 60 students being served in reading intervention and from those students, 85% of their STAR scores have increased. So our intervention time is time well spent for the students and um, we know that it's, that it's paying off. Um, we also have worked really hard to professionally develop our teachers this school year with the um, district training of depth and complexity. We have continued to have um, site trainings as well with our, um, with our in-house experts. And, um, and so we've spent some time on that. We've been able to procure some, some different materials and resources from depth and complexity. And we're planning on just moving forward with that and continuing to gain a deeper knowledge of that. But um, we also have had a few other teachers provide PD for us as well. Jerry Rivard, one of our ASD teachers, is a member of the organization CAPTAIN, which stands for California Autism Professional Training and Information Network. And so he has presented to us in staff meeting um, different tools and strategies that a gen ed classroom can use with students um, to maybe have them self-regulate or be independent learners. And then um, our intervention teachers have also offered strategies to classroom teachers that they can use to work with small groups in their classrooms. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about our amazing PTA. Um, I'm blown away at how much our PTA moms and dads love sellers. Like they are so supportive and we have been able to do some amazing things because of their support this year. They have held family nights such as the pizza night that we had this last Friday. We've had a movie night, ice cream Sunday. They also um, were, gave us the funds to be able to have a BMX show come on campus, which the kids loved. We have our imagination machine assembly coming soon, which PTA also um, helped us to purchase. And then the parent volunteer hours, I'm just blown away. There are constantly parents on campus. They're laminating, they're cutting, they're copying, they're in the classroom, they're helping the teacher with whatever she needs. And I, I just really, truly love our parents at Sellers. They have dedicated over 1,213 hours to just volunteer in our classrooms. And I think that you can really just tell, um, you know, the teachers and the, and the students are just really happy to have that kind of support. Um, like we talked about, we also have a be positive behavior system in place with our blue ticket system. But I've also implemented something called Freddy the Friday Hero. And I wanted an opportunity to um, recognize my teachers and my staff. And so uh, Freddie is a little stuffed Viking that um, visits a different classroom every week. And um, we just, he really goes to let the teachers or the staff member know how much I appreciate them and how much 
um, positive impact that they're making on the students. So Freddie is making his way around campus every Friday. Um, we also have a wonderful student support specialist. She um, works very closely with some of our special ed counseling as well as um, having some general ed counseling. She, her caseload is currently at 42, and she has found that this year the highest need has been individual counseling, but um, groups are being currently offered and planned for social skills, executive functioning, anxiety, and self-regulation. In addition, she opens her room every day at lunch for a different grade level to come in and have a place to relax, take a break, play games, create art. Uh, the kids love the wellness room. They're, they're constantly asking, is today my day for the wellness room? And um, they, they love going in and just spending some time with her. And um, she is just a wonderful, wonderful uh, staff member to have. And um, I know I couldn't do my job without her. <laughs> All right, so here are some uh, program highlights that I'd like to discuss. We have a really strong student council. Our student council um, had this really creative idea earlier in the school year that they wanted to take all of the coats and lunch boxes and sweaters and anything that was in the lost and found and have a fashion show. They wanted to reunite those items with the students. And so um, it was all their idea, like none of the teachers, they said, we want to do this. And so um, about a month or so ago, we had our first lost and found fashion, fashion show and were able to uh, reunite items with students. So that was really fun. Um, they have just been just a fun group. They are planning an end of the year um, talent show. So I'm looking forward to that as well. But um, it, they, they're a really neat group of, of fourth and fifth grade students. In addition, um, we have our, our um, Vikings Awards that we have at the end of each trimester. We celebrate student achievements. There's usually some academic achievements as well as character trait achievements. We have various clubs. We have a sewing club. They just finished uh, sewing a quilt, actually, and they've also, earlier in the year, sewed aprons, and um, we have probably about maybe eight to ten uh, girls in that club, and in fact, our sewing club sponsors have now opened it up to adults, so if you're interested in learning how to sew, we have a sewing club <laughs> that'll be starting soon. Um, we also have the Meg After School Language and Chess Club has been a really big hit for Seller students as well. Um, as I talked about earlier, in instruction, we have been looking closely at depth and complexity. And then a lot of my teachers um, wanted to learn more about writing and look at the Step Up to Writing program. And so we had quite a few take advantage of the Educator Effectiveness Academy, and um, I'm eager to kind of tap into that knowledge as we roll forward and have them start to share some of what they've learned um, because we want to have um, Sellers Vikings be strong writers. So looking forward to that. And then I want to brag on my TK for a moment because um, my TK teachers both were new to the district and they have done such an amazing job of implementing the new TK play-based program they have worked very closely with the other TK teachers in the district. They all developed a growth report. The parents at this last conference, this was the first time they conferenced with the TK teachers, and parents were blown away at the progress that their students were making. And a lot of them at first had been a bit skeptical, saying, well, but it isn't very academic. And now they're seeing that through this play-based program, our TK students are well on track to be ready for kindergarten and are developing those social skills to be good friends and good students. So I, I really am very, very proud of my TK teachers. All right, so then just a small look at some other things that are taking place around campus. Uh, we do have our great artist program that our PTA moms come and put on, and uh, each month the students learn about a different artist, and they get a chance to recreate that type of art. The uh, students and teachers alike just really enjoy the program. Um, we've got a picture here of our moon walk, which is our walkathon. I believe this year we raised just over $60,000.
And um, again, just blown away at the parental support that we have at Sellers. And we um, are already in the process. We just ordered our first set of Promethean boards with some of our PTA funds. So the teachers are excited about that. Um, we also had um, our BMX show there. Uh, we celebrated the 100th day of school in kindergarten. They wore workout gear because they had worked out their brains for 100 days. So that was a super fun day. And then, of course, our walk to school day is, is a big success. And then I've got a picture there of some of our TK turkeys. And i got to say, our TK... They are a fun bunch. If you ever, ever want to just come and visit the most life-affirming class, just go to a TK class because they will, they'll pump you up and make your day. All right. And then um, I have a short video that my student council uh, created for me, and they're just as proud to be Sellers Vikings as I am. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Principal Trent. Any questions from the board? I don't have any questions, which is so odd. Um, but I do want you to please send a message to your Vikings that that video was everything. It was really cute, and I, I've seen that. Of course, for this at, on, on Instagram a lot, so I love that they did that. <laughs> I hope they're not on Instagram, but I'm glad that they did that. <laughs> Um, thank you for presenting this. Uh, congratulations on almost wrapping up your first year. It's great to see you getting in there. Um, I hear great things from staff, students, uh, parents about you and your leadership style. So thank you for all that you do for our Vikings. Um, I'm glad you have made um, Sellers home and that GUSD has embraced you as well. So thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you also. Two Cliffords attend Seller School, <laughs> as you know, and they're very happy. And I went through the, uh, the TK um, report card, D's and E's and all the things that are on it, and it made a lot of sense. Pretty impressive. And moving them in the right direction to be no stranger to the class next door to them they're going to be in next year. So thank you for the environment, the learning environment, and they, they absolutely love coming to the school. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Our next report is from Whitcomb High School and Ms. Valentina Shibata. Thank you very much. Um, it's a little bit hard to follow that great presentation, but I'm going to do my best to um, show you how great Whitcomb is. So. Um, good evening, President Gary Clifford, members of the Board of Trustees, Superintendent Dr. Dominic DeGracia, Executive Cabinet members and our, our esteemed audience present both here and joining us online. 
My name is Val Shibata, and I, I am privileged to serve as the principal of Whitcomb High School and Alternative Programs. Here with me today is um, some of my wonderful staff to support me. Melissa Gurman is my lead teacher and also works um, in the GOAL program. Um, Shannon Mountfeld is our administrative assistant. I think that's her title. <laughs> Margaret Klein is our office manager. Um, Claire and Trilicia and, um, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little bit nervous, is our um, credit recovery teacher and also yearbook and leadership teacher. Robin uh, Davila is our math teacher. And then also we have one of our ATP aides, Miss Kim Healy, and also that's Gwen's boyfriend. <laughs> He's a, a graduate and Gwen is here. Um, but you guys don't know him already. <laughs> um, so it's a great honor to stand before you today to present an overview, overview of our school's progress, goals, and support for the benefit of our students. So first I want to explain that Whitcomb is really an alternative education center which has a diverse range of programs tailored to meet the unique needs of our students. Our school holds 20 brick and mortar classrooms and four portables. Our class size ranges from five students to 22 students with the lower class size being attributed to our special education classes. In addition to our continuation high school, we proudly offer three adult transition programs. Um, we have the SAIL program designed to support students with emotional disabilities the Glendora Online Academy of Learning or Goal Independent Study Program, and the Adult School. These are all part of our Whitcomb campus. For the purposes of today's discussion, my focus will be on the data pertaining to the continuation high school and the SAIL high school program. So I just want to give you a little bit of background regarding these programs. Our continuation program is specifically designed to address the needs of students who are credit deficient and may face challenges in graduating on time. Through targeted credit recovery classes and various interventions, we serve to provide the necessary support for their academic success. The SAIL program caters to students with emotional and behavioral disabilities, offering a more structured and supportive learning environment. It's important to note that while some students in this program may also be credit deficient, the primary focus of the SAIL program is to address their emotional and behavioral needs. Okay, so on to our um, student population. Our current enrollment stands at 97 students, a notable increase from the 72 students enrolled during the 22-23 academic school year. This growth is further increased by the addition of the 10th grade opportunity program in the second semester, contributing an additional 22 students to our school. Our two largest eth ethnic groups are Hispanic and white students, as you can see on our slide. Our two most significant groups are students who are social, socially economic, sorry, socioeconomically disadvantaged and our students with disabilities. You can see that over a third of our students have disabilities which is a large sub subgroup for such a small school like Wickham. Despite our modest size, Wickham and the alternative programs is very diverse, which has remained consistently diverse over the past five years, which is the second, um, uh, the second graph. <coughs> okay, our dashboard looks different from the dashboards from our sister schools. We have no performance colors on academic data because this data was based on testing our 11th grade students and we had less than 30 students. So they do not provide us with the color because of our low number of students. Prior to COVID, we had an alternative dashboard that used modified methods to evaluate alternative schools and their progress. However, in 2022, alternative schools were no longer allowed to use Modified methods and alternative schools like Wickham are currently treated the same as comprehensive schools as far as our data is concerned. The data that I am showing here comes from our CASP data. Out of the 23 students 
that were tested, 58.3% did not meet standards, which is shown in the green. <coughs> Excuse me. This is typical for students at a continuation high school. Oh, thank you. I've been dealing with this cough for like three weeks. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so um, this data is typical for students at a continuation high school. Um, our students come to us credit deficient and struggle academically. Therefore, our goal is to show improvement over the years in our data. Our English data is very consistent with our 2022 data. I'm working with my teachers to increase the rigor in the classroom and hope to see our scores increase for the next year. This goal was aligned with our district LCAP goal, our school plan, and our WASC action plan. Uh, one way we are currently working on this is by using our district-focused depth and complexity tools in the classroom, increasing admin walkthroughs, and providing more teacher planning time and collaboration time with the staff. Teachers are also encouraged to attend content-specific conferences and attend professional development workshops. Okay, so our um, academic performance in math. Improving math achievement is also part of our school plan and WASC action plan. Given the challenges our students face in this subject area, the data indicates that 86.5% of our students did not meet math standards as shown in the green. It is important to recognize that many of our students arrive at Whitcomb High School with significant deficits in math, having experienced multiple academic setbacks in this subjects. Moreover, 64% of our current 11th grade students have previously failed two or more math classes before enrolling at Wickham. Um, and you can see from the data that's been consistent over the past two years. <coughs> we are working to increase our math achievement in similar ways that we are working to increase our English achievement by using district-focused depth and complexity tools in the classroom, increasing walkthroughs, and providing more teacher planning time and collaboration time with the staff and attending conferences and workshops. We are re researching strategies to help our students develop the math skills necessary to demonstrate mastery of math standards. Even though our data looks different than most, it is important that we do not discount the data, but use it to help us identify the learning gaps to support our student achievement. Okay, at Wickham, we have positive attendance accounting which means that we take attendance every period and it is reported to the state. The state only requires us to be in school 180 minutes per day and we far exceed that amount. We have a very high absenteeism rate, which is one of the reasons that students struggle academically. The average number of days absent has increased since 2020 by 6.7 days. This year, we focus on increasing attendance by looking at our monthly attendance support reports, we have increased our attendance hours by 7.82% this to, over this time last year. So we have been increasing. Our focus on attendance includes educating our students and parents about the importance of attendance, sharing our attendance policy, and holding students accountable. We reach out to families by phone and email, student and parent conferences, letters home, home visits, and attendance contracts through the SART and SART process. I have been meeting with students as an advisory committee to get their opinions on attendance as well. We also have rewards and incentives for students who have good attendance and celebrate one student weekly for having good attendance. By creating a um, positive school climate and culture, students feel comfortable and enthusiastic about attending school. We work on building positive relationships with our students so they are connected and feel encouraged to attend school. <coughs> I am pleased to report that our graduation rate has shown a marked um, improvement from the previous year reflected by the green indicator. We are committed to sustaining this upward trend by supporting our students in credit recovery and uh, current grade level coursework. To ensure our seniors are well prepared for graduation and equipped with a plan after high school, we dedicated, 
excuse me, our dedicated counselor meets with each senior to develop a personalized graduation plan and discuss their future goals. Furthermore, our counselor actively collaborates with local community colleges to host workshops, focus on college application and FAFSA assistance, supporting a seamless transition for our graduating seniors into community college or trade schools. In addition, we partner with the Regional Occupation Program, ROP, to provide our students with information about career options. It is important to note that our socioeconomically disadvantaged students graduated at a slightly lower rate. Our counselor is aware of the needs of these students and is committed to providing them with a comprehensive academic support and access to additional resources essential for their success. Through targeted interventions and personalized assistance, our counselor works to bridge the achievement gap and ensure equitable opportunities for all our students, regardless of socioeconomic background. Our college and career indicator is very low with only 2.2% prepared. However, this is consistent with our pre-pandemic numbers of 2% prepared. We are looking at ways to improve this at Whitcomb by focusing on CTE pathway completion and increasing test scores on CASP. We are also discussing opportunities for students to take community college courses while still at Wickham. Our suspension rate increased from 2% to 3.8%, which, because of our small numbers, is a difference of four students. Currently, we have nine suspensions and multiple referrals for truancy, defiance, and fighting. We're looking for ways to provide alternatives to suspension and have more restorative consequences. There's currently a committee looking at alternatives to suspension, and we are waiting to hear their recommendations. Some alternatives that we have used at Whitcomb include on-campus suspension, class detention, lunch detention, completion of care courses, and behavior contracts. Overall, we want our students to learn life skills and know that there are consequences for their actions. And as I reflect on this data and the needs of our students, I want to maintain focus on our school plan goals, which align with our WAS goals and the district outcome. Our focus will continue to be, number one, increase academic rigor in, class, in all classes. Number two, increase student achievement in math. Number three, increase student achievement in English. Number four, increase access to interventions for mental and emotional health. And what we're doing in that area is we are currently providing character strong lessons weekly um, to provide support for all of our students. And for those who need more um, additional support, our counselor works one-on-one -on -one with those students. And then number five, increase access to college and career readiness courses. And number six, improve attendance. <coughs> okay, we have many great programs at Whitcom, and I would just like to highlight a few of them for you today. We want our students to know that they will be recognized for their achievements, attendance, and school spirit. A new program this year is the Wildcat of the Week, where students are recognized for having perfect attendance for the week. It resets every week so students can feel that it is an achievable goal. So far, we have recognized 24 students as Wildcats of the Week. In the area of instruction, uh, we are giving our teachers time to share their best practices with each other. It is a unique experience to teach at a continuation high school, and our best ideas come from those who teach the same students. By sharing what works in their classroom, we are building a strong academic foundation. Our staff is known for fostering positive relationships with their students and being caring and supportive. When I ask students what they like best about Whitcomb, they always say they like their teachers best. One student said, teachers bond with students and work with us. It makes us feel less stressed and that school is more enjoyable. Our whole school is an intervention for students and the sports the supports that we provide include pre-enrollment orientation, small class size, flexible scheduling, and credit recovery options. Our goal is to have our students graduate on time. 
And here is a look at a couple of pictures of um, our students at school. And at Whitcomb, we recognize students for their achievements. Many of them come to Whitcomb and have never been recognized at school for anything positive. So we look for ways to show students that we see their efforts and acknowledge their accomplishments. And actually, our staff is encouraged to do weekly shout outs to students where they recognize something positive in their students and we share that weekly. We have a staff, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> we have a staff that is very involved in activities around the school. Our staff have donated items, served students, participated in events, and have gone above and beyond to show their support to our students. We are also known for a caring staff who understands that students struggle and they are always willing to give a hug if needed. We have a great leadership class that plans fun events to create an inclusive culture on campus. They have organized HOCO, Red Ribbon Week, Yellow Ribbon Week, Dia de los Muertos, and Spirit Days to name a few. However, our main focus is always on student achievement and helping our students recover credits and get back on track to graduate on time. At Wickham, we're a small school with a big heart. Our students love the cozy feel of our small cl classes in campus. They enjoy know knowing most, almost everyone, which makes them feel comfortable and safe. Coming to Wickham feels like being part of a family where they can truly be themselves and be celebrated for who they are. We're all about making sure every student feels at home and supported to succeed. And as you can see in our pictures, um, our students are wearing their Wildcat shirts because they're proud to be Wildcats. <laughs> and I just want to thank you for allowing me to share some of the great things that are happening at Wickham. And I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you for your presentation and thank you to all the staff that are here tonight. We thank appreciate you. this exciting <laughs> moment. Any questions from the board? I do. Yes. Just, just a few things. You don't have to convince me. I know that Whit Whitcomb is a great school. <laughs> I am excited. I am a little disappointed you forgot to mention PTSA. <gasps> <laughs> I'll let you go now. And I, we love our PTSA, and they do a great job in providing all kinds of support and fundraising events for our campus. Okay, including good. our ladies' night out that we yes, just had. Very successful. Out. That's important because there are not many alternative high schools that have a PTSA. You so, are right about that. Yeah, so we have to be very proud about that, Absolutely. and it's been there for probably thirty years or more. I haven't been involved that long, but. Thank you Probably for reminding did. me. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I think the good thing, there's so many good things about Whitcomb, and it's not just for bad kids. You know, some people tend to think that. It, I think it's for kids who learn differently, and sometimes I know this one student who graduated several years ago. She just needed a smaller class and just, you know, she kind of got lost at Glendora High School. Mm -hmm. And when she got to Whitcomb, she flourished. They had, you know, she was in journalism or yearbook and leadership and all of that. And it was, it was great. And she has gone on to graduate from a university. And That's I know great. one of our SLPs that graduated from Whitcomb. And what's, what's Amber's R&D? Amber, um, what's her name? She was on PTA. Anyway, they have the sign Amber, company. Amber Rice. Amber Rice. Anyway, and she and her husband own a business. My And I know that we always have students speak, and I love that. But I think that if we had someone who graduated from Whitcomb, who went on and graduated from college, speak at graduation for five minutes, would make a difference. Um, my youngest That's daughter a had a good idea. friend, and they were in gate together. And after graduation, she went to Wick, ended up going to Whitcomb, and she graduated. And I ran into her at Del Taco where she was working. She goes, "I really just messed up my life," and she didn't. I mean, she, she was 18. I think they <laughs> need to see that going to Wickham can can improve themselves. I mean, they graduate from high school, right. but I just think if 
I've been mentioning this for several years, so Val, I'm counting on you. <laughs> just, I just, yes, I'll, look, I, I'll look somebody up for sure. <laughs> yeah, one of our SLPs, do you know who it is? <laughs> yes, so anyway, I just think that that was in, is, is good. Okay. Um, I think the most important thing that you have is love for the students, that all of the teachers, you can feel it when you're there, they respect them and understand that they're great. And I just, I love being on the campus and, and seeing that and going into the classrooms. Um, Thank you. And your attendance policy, I think that is such a good thing because, so, you know, it's hard to get them there and, and sometimes that's been the problem is that they don't go to school. But if when they're seen and encouraged, like, like you and your staff is doing, it's a, it's a great thing. Um, Thank you. And that's all. Thanks, Val. You did a great Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your presentation was wonderful. I know you said you were nervous. You did great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like for you to tell us a little bit more about the 10th grade opportunity program. I know that's fairly new. Um, what does that look like and how does it differ from the students coming in from high school, from uh, the GHS with re more of a recovery um, lens or whatever, need, need for recovery? How, do, how does okay. that differ? Yeah, our 10th grade opportunity program is um, it's for students, 10th graders, who are also behind on credits. Um, but we wanted to bring them in sooner than waiting until they turn 16 or, be, or in 11th grade um, in order for them to start recovering credits because at that point, sometimes kids feel like this huge burden and it's really hard to you know dig themselves out of that hole. So we wanted to start with intervention sooner rather than later. And the 10th grade opportunity program looks just very much like um, the regular Wickham program, um, only we just have a little cohort of 10th graders that are in every core class together. So they're all either really good friends or really enemies. <laughs> so um, they all stay together <coughs> in their core classes. And um, they're there to recover their credits. And they actually, besides you know um, being a little bit young, they're actually coming to school more often and doing better and they're a great group of kids so um, we just want them we what we just want to help them sooner That's why okay they're so they're moving along together as a cohort and is the goal that you know at the end of the school year they've caught up hopefully and then send them back to uh, Glendora High School or is it that you know maybe for some Whitcomb is the place to be and that's where they're gonna thrive yeah. Um, it's really a case-by-case -case basis depending on how many credits they need to um, recover. But some students are very motivated to just quickly catch up and return to Glendora. And some are taking the longer route. <laughs> They're very comfortable there. So um, we're there to help them in whichever way they want to recover their credits. And as far as attendance for this 10th grade um, opportunity program, do you see a difference in the attendance for your 10th grade cohort versus the other students? I see, real, um, I haven't looked at the numbers um, that way, like, you know, breaking it up by grade level, but I just, um, you know, anecdotally just seeing them on campus, I see the 10th graders very often. <laughs> They're there every day. They really seem to enjoy being on a smaller campus. Okay, and I know when did they when did this start? When was when was second semester? Okay, so I would love to hear some update. Um, I don't know at what point that would be best to do to see how that's working and how many of the twenty two that came onto campus of this cohort went back or you know were able to um, get those credits back in place and see how that. I don't know how many months you need for that or if it would be next year or. Yeah, yeah, I would love okay. to see that in the future. Perfect. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question on this 10th grade cohort? Oh, okay. Um, how, so um, how is it determined who would enter this cohort? And is there a limit to the number of students that you would take in that 10th grade opportunity program? Yes, yeah, so we met um, with GHS and we um, talked about every 10th grade student that, um, you know, was a possible transfer. And we looked at those that were in most need of recovering credits to bring them on first. And it's also, um, Whitcomb is also a um, voluntary program, mm. so their parents <coughs> had to agree to that. So there were some parents that weren't quite ready for that yet. 
So it was a combination of those that had the greatest needs and those whose parents were um, agreeing to have them transfer. Um, and we do have a limit of, right now we're pretty much at our limit of, you know, no more than, you know, we re I really wanted to keep it 20 or less, but there were some 16-year-old 10th graders that I can't prevent them from transferring, so they ended up transferring. Um, but we, we have such a small staff that we could really only handle one cohort of 10th graders okay. at this time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, for, as far as your data is concerned, first off, let me go back and say I'm so proud to um, be in a district that supports an alternative education high school. Like, I think it's not every district has them, and it's a really um, important asset to our district and to our students so that everybody can find their pathway to success. So I just want to say that. I want to thank all of your teachers and staff members in the back that came tonight because um, I, I, I've been there, and I see the individual attention that all of your staff, your entire employee staff, um, gives to these students in the one-on-one -on -one um, relationships that they develop and um, that that takes um, a special person so thank you all for being here tonight and thank you for Definitely everything that you do for these staff. students um, as far as your testing data um, are your 11th grade goal students that are taking the tests is their data going back to Glendora High School or how does that work yeah so our goal students are actually still enrolled in their home school so they're okay um, so their data goes to their home school. Okay. But we do have a small group of goal students from Whitcomb. Okay. So only the goal Whitcomb students will um, be a part of our data. Okay. Okay. And are those goal Whitcomb students participating in the same? It's not edgenuity anymore. What is it? Yeah. It, it is, is edgenuity? edgenuity. Uh -huh. Yes, they are. But is, it, is there? Okay. Um, I thought there was another name. There was another company that bought edgenuity. Imagine, see, I'm not making this up as I go along. Thank you very much. Um, are they, are those students doing the same Edgenuity platform as the 11th grade students from Glendora High School, or does their platform look different as far as recovery is concerned? So if they're taking their original credit courses, like the first time they're taking an English or math or okay. uh, whatever course, um, it, it's a full course just like a Glendora okay. student. But if they are retaking a course, they're put on a credit recovery um, program, uh -huh. which just is kind of a condensed, yeah, condensed um, okay. version. Okay. All right. I'm familiar with that. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I do appreciate your um, attendance policy. I know it wasn't the most uh, popular <laughs> policy at the beginning of the school year, but I think it has been effective and encourage you. you to continue on um, yeah, doing everything we can. Because as you stated in your presentation, if students aren't there, it's really hard for them to learn. Exactly. So um, getting these kids in their seats is really uh, is really important. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Whitcomb has a very special place uh, in my heart as well, and um, I'm I'm. Thank you very much. I do think that we should give Gwen the opportunity to give any have any questions or feedback also. <laughs> Just a thought. That's right. Uh, yeah, do you have questions? You, you don't have to. You don't have to do that at all. If you'd like to do that. No, you're good. You can. You can just make a comment about being a student there. Okay. <laughs> right. let, let me let me ask let me ask the president, and then we'll get back to it. <laughs> no, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. And as Whitcomb is a great place, as I've known, we've had a lot of students over my years at Glendora High School that transferred over, and it's a it, it, it is a phenomenal place for students to go, and they some find themselves there, and some move back to Glendora High School, which is uh, which is really good. Um, still, it sounds like you're still doing the alternative placement committee. You did it for the sophomores. You're still doing it with the, with the kids, so you guys are exactly. still meeting about every individual kid that wants to come back to Glendora <coughs> or that's going to go to Wickham for a while or whatever that's going to be. So you're still using the committee. Good, yes. and that's working for out the well. Most so part, yes. Sometimes there's a few exceptions. Oh yeah, for very sure. Very few. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few you do through, through phone calls and things like that. Right. No, very very well done. Um, I always appreciate Wickham and appreciate what the students accomplish there. And I've always said, and I always tell students all the time. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And everybody does have a different path. 
So, exactly. and, it, and it's okay to take that path. So kudos and good, and good work and Thank just you. keep it going. Thank you. I have a couple. <laughs> um, like everyone's been saying, it's a, it's a great school. You know, um, I, don't, I don't have any questions because I'm, I'm there, so I, I know what's going on. But um, it, it's an amazing school. I, I never went to JHS. I started out homeschooling, so I started with no credits. So I have done four years of high school in two years, and it's all been because of last year's principal and Miss Javada doing an amazing job and all the teachers. It's truly just the best thing that's happened to me. And I know that a lot of other students will say the same thing. And I come home every day and I tell my family all the fun, crazy things that happen. And now my little sister is so excited to go to Woodcombe too. <laughs> and she's so excited that she can go as a sophomore. And it's just an amazing place to be. And I think Miss Javada, you were doing an amazing job as a new principal and it's I, I definitely see the changes and it's definitely great so thank you very thank much thank you thank you Gwen we are proud of you too <laughs> you can see it I'm new to this and I don't comprehend all of this stuff as well as my peers do so there's on this on the slide that you have that shows um, the alternative the, all of the different entities, I guess it's your first or second slide. Uh -huh. You have 97 total students, right? For just the Whitcomb High School and the SAIL program, and it does include Whitcomb Gold students. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you have, you have the adult transition program, that doesn't count those students? No, there's so how approximately, many approximately 30, 30 students that are in our adult transition program. Okay. And then in the sale program? In the sale program, there's about 10. Okay. And then in the, I don't understand, the goal program sounds like it's disconnected from the school, but some people are housed there, like the <laughs> teachers maybe? So our teachers are there at Whitcomb, and there's about, um, I believe, 128 students, that correct? One hundred and twenty-eight students, and yes, it is a little confusing because I'm the principal over the program, but yet the students are still connected to their home school. So any issues regarding I don't, I don't understand what that means. They're connected uh, to their home school. I can mean I can help data? explain their physical with you. home or a school that sponsors their home study. Um, the school that they transferred from. So if a student from GHS goes into goal, their data will still go to GHS. So because Goal is not its own school, it doesn't have its own school identifier, it's not registered as a, an alternative um, independent study school, the students remain in their home school. So for example, if they're middle schoolers, even though their teacher is housed at Goal at, at Whitcomb, they're still enrolled at Goddard or at Sandburg. They can still go to those school events. They're still part of that. If they wanted to transfer back in person, they would go there. Um, so their data stays there because Goal itself isn't registered as a separate school. So Goal, the 128 students that are at Goal, with the exception of you said some of them are Whitcomb students, mm -hmm. approximately. Um, 12 to 15 are okay. Whitcomb students. So I'll, I'll just say maybe 110 of those students belong to a home school in our district somewhere. Correct. That could be from elementary through the high school. Correct. And yes. so their data and their all the other things get reported out in one of the other mm -hmm. reports that we have. And yes. then the adult school. Um, so we have two programs for the adult school. One is the graduation program, which is about 15, 12 to 15 students. And then the other one is the parent um, child participation class, or the uh, mom, mom, you mean, what do you call it? Parents of Little Learners. Parents of Little Learners, and that is a, an amazing program that's at capacity with, I believe, about 30 parents. The parents are enrolled because it's the adult school, so it's about 30 parents that are enrolled with their child. Okay, yeah. and is there and that data doesn't get reported no. out anywhere. It's just a, the, another. Little yeah, it's service. an adult school program, so it's not included in this data. Okay, mm -hmm. I appreciate that sure. clarification. And the other thing, on your uh, data for absent absenteeism, it says a average days absent forty six point seven. 
So does that mean that on that per student, the aver the X bar is that if you were just to take the average, that students are absent forty six times in the school year. Is that what that data? Represents. Um, okay, so I may need to refer to um, <laughs> Sarah about that, but I think it's a total number of days that all of our students are absent. Averages out to forty. I mean, it's an average. It says average days <laughs> absent. It's actually, average day of students that are absent. This was from twenty two twenty three. That's reported to um, CD from Health. Okay, and then the the last question that I. I don't understand, and that's just, again, because it's on the academic side. The slide that talked about academic performance and the, um, the standards and being below the standard, mm -hmm. that number, I'm sure you're working, it's not a good number, mm -hmm. but I mean, it, it's a number, but then right. the graduation rate is like 85%. That looks like a good number. How, right. do they, how do they correlate with each other? Um, because the dashboard looks at changes from the previous year. So because we improved in our graduation rate from our previous year, it shows that we're in the green because we graduated a good uh, percentage of our students. But yes, you're right that our um, you know, academic data is very low, but it, it doesn't correlate with the graduation rate. I mean, it's not correlated. It doesn't affect the graduation rate numbers. It's just a standardized test. Yeah. It's not their classes. It just that they score, how they score on this oh, test. That doesn't impact whether or not you get to graduate. That doesn't right. Okay. Those two are not yeah. linked. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that's oh, enough questions. for right now. Maybe oh, great I'll question. meet with you later. Sure. <laughs> I, just, anytime. I just want to understand I, it a little better. Thank it's, you. It's alternative, right? It is. It, it, it's different. I want to understand the data a little better. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for this opportunity. Thank you. Any other questions? So those are our st yes. Yeah. When, when someone leaves in your way out, would you mind closing that door? Nice to see you. Good night. Thank you for hanging out. Okay, so those were great presentations. Thank you for hanging in there. Oh, come on. You all want to hear the second they interim do. budget report. That, ta yeah, no. that takes us to item 6.1 which is approval of the 2023-2024 second interim report as presented. And I will turn that over to our new assistant superintendent, Ms. Walzak. Uh, Mr. I need a motion. Uh, I, I, I move approval of the second interim report. Really? Before do, we don't yeah. want to hear it and then make a motion. I and think you have to have the motion in the second, and then, and then you we always have this discussion. And, and I, I don't. <coughs> and then you vote. Second. Okay. okay. Did, she did, did we get a motion? We have a yes. motion and we have a second. Yes. Now we can hear it. Once again, cleared the room. So. <laughs> right? Well, good evening, esteemed board members, Dr. DeGracia, cabinet, colleagues, and there's no community members present, maybe online. Anyway, we're here tonight to present the second interim report, and we're certifying positive, and we're asking the Board of Trustees to approve our second interim. So we are on the second installment of the three financial reports that school districts are required to report to the state. The second interim covers the period of July 1st to June 30th, and it's due to LACO on uh, March 15th. Some of the things that we are reporting are the results of the fin financial results and the projections. So basically we're um, looking at our current adopted budget, which we approved um, for the first interim in January, and
and so we're making adjustments to see to basically our budget is fluid so anytime we feel or we see that there's changes that we need to make we then make those adjustments and it also of course helps determine the fiscal viability of the districts some of the budget adjustments are caused by routine financial changes we update the categorical revenues and expenses and we also update the expenditures to with the most current data available and then also we run our LCFF projection and um, and do any type of adjustments based on that current data as far as interims uh, second interim assumptions again we're, we want to talk about the ADA or the average daily attendance and we are still funded on based on the three years uh, prior three years ADA for 22-23 our ADA is 6 six thousand one forty one point five three twenty one twenty two sixty four twenty two point two four twenty twenty um is sixty eight sixty three point nine two with a funded ADA of six thousand four hundred seventy five point nine for twenty four twenty five we're taking a big dip of a projected ADA of sixty one sixty four point eleven so I just want to, again, I have to keep reiterating that because of the pandemic, we were on the, we were using the higher number from 2020-21, which is roughly 6,800 plus in ADA. Um, and then the next one after that, it's also another high number. So now those high numbers are falling off. So we're basically um, took, are taking the, the, the cliff, the diving off the cliff and so now we're left with 6,141. Um, our unduplicated pupil count three-year rolling average is 38.19. Our COLA remained unchanged at 8.22 percent and we had a slight decrease in our LCFF funding by 83,000. In comparing our fund balance components from the adopted budget to the second interim basically adopted budget like I mentioned is from the first interim um, revolving cash in stores remain at 40,000 the state required 3% minimum reserved for economic uncertainty we have adopted budget 3,020,309 and then second interim 3 million eight thousand and fifty two a decrease of twelve thousand two fifty seven we have the projected assigned reserve balance a decrease of twelve thousand two fifty six currently sitting at four million seven hundred fifteen thousand eight hundred seventy nine our total unrestricted fund balance is thirteen million one hundred seventy six dollars and seventy six thousand and seventy six dollars um, as far as general fund revenues are concerned, as I mentioned earlier, we made a slight adjustment with our LCFF entitlement, decrease of 83626 a, a slight increase in federal revenue um, from 6503 515 I mean, I mean $6,514,871. Other state revenue decreased by 2,702, no change in local revenue, and overall a revenue decreased by 74,972. The next is just a pie chart that illustrates the breakdown of our revenues. So LCFF sources, it's 81% of our general fund revenues, federal 6%, other states 6% and local and other local revenue 7%. When it comes to our general fund expenditures, as, as far as our adjustments go, there's a slight adjustment related to certificated salaries, classified salaries increase by $830,020, um, going from $15.5 million to $16.3 million and that is related to the wage classification study that was conducted. Employee benefits increase as a result of the wage classification study. It's increased by almost $300,000. Books and supplies, very minimal. Services, minimal as well. 
capital outlay decrease by $1.8 million, and that's related to ESSER, um, ESSER 3. We have to expand the ESSER 3 by September um, 30, 2024, due to the uh, various red tape presented by CDE. Our original plan was to, um, related to the HVAC, like changing out some of the HVAC, and, but you have to submit anytime we have a capital outlay greater than $5,000 and we're using the federal funds, we have to submit um, an approval from the CDE. Over the past couple of years, every time we've submitted a plan, it's, it's just been getting kicked back and forth. So what we've decided to do is use the ESSER 3 for um, our one-time our one-time um, uh, salary bonus that we we gave out this year, so that way we can move it to from the general fund into the ESSER, and so we can then utilize and make sure that that fund it is expended. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna do the HVAC that we had planned. It basically just moves it, gives us the flexibility to not have the deadline to have to have all of those things done and having the, the red tape for having the, the CDE approve the plan. So that was that, that's that adjustment. Um, again, the next one is just a pie chart showing what our general fund expenditures are. So certificate, certificate, certificated salaries is 43% of our general fund budget, classified 16%, employee benefits for both um, certificated and classified 18%, and that totals roughly 80% of our budget. We have materials and supplies, 8%, services and other operating costs, 10%, and then capital outlay and other outgo, about 5%. In looking at the general fund ending fund balance, um, we're comparing the, for the whole entire year we have the original budget, which were which was approved in June, the um, the current adopted budget, the first interim, and now the second um, um, interim. Um, our general fund, our general ending fund balance is thirty million two hundred twenty two thousand five hundred seventy one. Moving along to our multi-year projection assumption. So like I mentioned earlier, we have to show um, our county and our uh, CDE that we could sustain the next, the next our current year plus the two out years. So our, our enrollment projection for 23-24 um, is 65-25, or beginning with 65-25, we had a decrease of 190 students during the current year, and our current year enrollment is at 6,335. For 24-25, we have a, a decline of one, a projected decline of 150, putting us at 6,185 students at 24-25 school year. And then for the second out year, which is the 25-26 school year, we're projected to to lose 135 kids, and that gives us a projected enrollment of 6,050. We're working closely with Ed Services um, to get you know a better projection as far as our incoming TK and Kinder, which I which we believe is instrumental in our projection. Our funded ADA for this year is 6,475.8. Our projected 24-25 budget is 6,064.11. And 25-26, we're hitting below 6,000, which is 5,882.46. If you want to do the math, we're cur currently each ADA is about $10,000. So we're losing about uh, three, you know, 388 points um, from 2324 to 2425. So 300 times 10,000, that's about $3 million that we're losing in the budget. Um, our cost of living adjustment 
for next year, 0.76, that really eats up, really, it's not giving us really any cost of living adjustment. If you, if you do the math, it's actually a negative, um, negative impact that COLA does not really do anything because of our significant decline and in enrollment and our ADA, which is the average daily attendance. Our UPP is also decreasing. Back from 2020, 21 during the pandemic, we were used, there was another methodology utilized to, um, to get the data for our UPP. And so that gave us a, an increase, but now those are, years are falling off and we are more um, in the 25, 26 school year. That's, that is most likely our current, that's more uh, the correct number since all the years that were somewhat um, are, have fallen off. So currently this year, our uh, not using the three year rolling average, but our current year for the 24, 25 is roughly about that 26 point points, 26.76%. And when we're talking about the UPP, that number is really important as well because when they're when the CDE is giving allocation for different things, such as you know, um, some of the block grants that we're getting, like the learning recovery and things like that, they go off of our UPP. Um, ELOP program as well is based off of our ELOP. So when our, e when our UPP decreases, our funding um, grants received from the, from the state also decreases. Again, just wanted to show a graph of our enrollment. So here we, we incorporated the second, the two out years, 24, 25, 25, 26 on the left here. Um, we're, we're, base, we're just declining a lot. Um, and it originally, I believe the last year or the year before, we were projecting that 20, 25, 26 was somewhat going to be a flat year where we're not going to be losing a lot of students. But based on the data this year, it appears that that's not going to be the case. Um, we are projected to right now with the way the numbers are for 2526 projected to lose 135 um, enrollment kids and then 2425 is 150 from 2223 to 2324 we lost 190 students and then the funded ADA Again, um, like I mentioned earlier, from 23-24 to 24-25, um, we're going to lose about 315. And then 25-26, about 281.65. As Dr. DeGrasio's report earlier, it's really important. Um, attendance matters. Kids at their seats matter because that's what generates our, our funding in the past, right before the pandemic, we were at about 97% our um, ADA rate, and then we went down to about 91, 92 during the pandemic, and now we're starting to just to increase to, I believe we're about 95, roughly. So we're hoping to get back to that same level before the pandemic, which was about 96, 97%. In looking at our LCFF dollars for 23-24, it's at 79.3 million. And then 24-25, that's, that's where you're seeing that, de uh, that decline in, in our ADA rate. So we're receiving roughly about $4 million less from 79.3 to 75.4 in funding. And then 25-26, we're dipping another $2 million. So that's fairly significant for us, for our district. Um, so some of the, oh, sorry. So we're just here, some of the categorical um, colas, the same thing, 8.22. Next year, 8.76. And then 25.26 is 2.73. We're having the May revise. 
which is the, the governors, you know, through any changes from the January proposed budget, that's when we'll get a better idea of where our COLA will land and where the K-12 um, education lands as well. Some of our statutory benefits for the certificated sites were not, there hasn't been any changes, which is great. The STIRS rate remains remains the same at 19.1 from 23.24 to 20.25.26. Medicare rate is at 1.45. State unemployment is 0.05%, and workers' comp rate is 1.2%. Total certificated statutory is 21.8. As far as classified, it's a different story because the purse rate continued to increase. Um, going from 23-24 is 26.68, 2024-25, and then 25-26 is 28.5. As for classified, we also have to pay into the OA OASDI, which is basically the Social Security, and that is 6.2%. Medicare is 1.45. Workers' Comp is 1.2. Total classified statutory is 35.58 this year, 36.7% next year, and 37.4% the, the out years. Again, um, those purse rate could still change, so we'll find out more where the, the numbers are in the next year's, uh, in that, sorry, next in the couple of months may revise. Budget challenges. What are some of the budget challenges we're facing? As a state, um, California, the, as far as the revenue and everything goes, we they the the actual revenues collected is about twenty four billion dollars less than what they what the governor budgeted for. So there's definitely that going on, um, and we're hoping that it doesn't really hit the the Kate the the schools in K-12 K or K-14. But as a district, some of our challenges are the declining enrollment. We're losing a lot of kids, and then we encourage, again, um, that kids show up to class if they're able to, as it helps us with our ADA funding. We have the annual salary adjustment, which is basically the step and column increases, and that's based on either your years of service and the for certificated, it's acquiring more um, education. Inf inflation rate continues to increase. And then, of course, the CalSTRS, more like the CalPERS pension contribution, continuing to increase as well. Right here, I just or just putting some of the pictures. Um, in this picture, it's a GS, GHS Kindness Club helping the elementary kids during the, the during the, one of the rainy days. Um, as I talked about earlier, the state budget, just you know, the revenues and yeah, <laughs> so it's a little gloomy. So, <laughs> but the picture is great. So district certification. <laughs> The district is certifying second interim report to be positive, which means that we are we can um, continue to be positive in the next three years, and that's a requirement. Projected general ending fund balance is above the 3% minimum required, and positive certification indicates that the district will be able to meet its financial obligations for the current and the two subsequent fiscal years. What are the next steps? We have to submit this report to LACO by March 15th. And then we have our AD, our P2, which is the average uh, P2 report due in April 15th. And then next we have um, the governor releases the 2024-25 budget, May budget revise. And then our next step is our budget budget development for the 24-25 fiscal year, and that the hearing is on June 17th. And that wraps up our second interim presentation. Are there any questions? 
I made Thank it you. without coffee. So Thank you. Presentation. Um, now that the presentation is made, are there any comments or any questions about that? I don't really have any questions. I do appreciate your um, transparency on the impact that our enrollment is going to have on our budget. That um, taking a $3 million hit on our budget because we'll have 300 less kids is a significant amount of money that has to come from somewhere and the state isn't going to make it up in their COLA adjustment. We're gonna be at a deficit that way. So um, that money's gonna to have to come from somewhere. Um, and it's important that everybody is aware of that and that um, financial staff is going to be making recommendations, working with their counterparts in both Ed Services and Human Resources to figure out what we're going to do as far as that's concerned. So thank you for making that blatantly clear um, for anybody who might be uh, perusing this report at their leisure. Um, I appreciate all the work that your team puts into um, having to get these reports ready for us and approved by the um, required dates. So thank you very much. I had a question, but I think you answered it. I just want to clarify. As far as the projected COLA for 2025-2026, it says 2.73, but that won't be confirmed until the May budget, correct? Correct, and okay. that could still change when the governor provides the, uh, when he comes back with our budget proposal for our 25-26, which is January of 2020. Okay. Yeah. So even the number that we get in May could still change in January? Yeah. Okay. And then my second question is, you mentioned the uh, UPP and the methodology changing. Is that related to the free and reduced uh, lunch application, or is that something different? Correct. It's the free and reduced lunch and the income, what is it called? The income surveys. The income we surveys that went reduced. back out. So, yeah. So that, not, that was done during the pandemic. Um, you want to talk? Can I bring Sarah up to talk yeah, about Yeah, so the how are we I identifying our UPP numbers? Right now we're at 29.9%. Um, oh, um, we It's direct certification, um, so Medi-Cal, um, anybody on benefits that way, and then the applications as well. So um, between those two, we're at 29.9. And how are you doing with applications? I remember, I think it was the last report we discussed that, you know, Parents we made are not really push. filling them out because lunch is free for everyone. Yeah. But how did that work out? We made, we've made a big push. Um, I would say, I'm trying to picture the report off the top of my head, so don't quote me on the numbers, but I would say we're in the mm, 23 percentages on direct certification and then the other six, about 6% 6 is through the applications. So the applications aren't, um, it's important and... Um, we're not probably getting as many as maybe we could, so we're getting most of those UPP numbers from direct certification. So we are trying to get more and more applications. We did put it as a step in our um, data confirmation um, at the beginning of the school year. Um, I do believe that this year, hopefully we will have some increases on that as people really start to understand the benefits of having that application because um, when um, and if they qualify for free and or reduced lunch, they become part of our ELOP program, which brings a lot of benefits um, to different things that they can um, get for a uh, minimal or end or free cost, including daycare. So, so based on, I know you don't have the exact number, but based on what your experience is in the, in the district, mm -hmm. what do you think is that discrepancy between the 29% that ha is reported and what you think we actually have? Well, I will tell you this. Pre-pandemic, this is where we were at. Okay. So pandemic, we in increased a lot because of the income-based surveys um, versus the applications. So this is actually pre-pandemic, we were about 26, 27%. There was one year we were almost at 30%. So we are reporting where we were pre-pandemic. Do I think we have uh, families out there where we could be probably maybe 33, 34% possibly? Um, that's just an, uh, an assumption, um, just knowing what's happening in the community and within you know, um, the state of economics today. Do I think that 29.9 realistically could be in the um, lower 30s? Yes, but we are pretty much where we were pre-pandemic um, with direct certification and applications. Probably more direct certification 
now, which is again reflective of the economic states. Great, thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, I had one more that I just totally forgot. I forgot, if it comes back to me, I'll be back. Um, one thing I noticed you said that we have our general ending fund balance is above the 3%. Do we still have our 6%? Yes, it's in the, uh, the other 3% is part of the assigned balance. So yes, we still have the, the 6%. Good, we worked hard for that. Yes, it's still um, there. I, I just, just wanted to say thank you. Um, a few years ago, someone, you were talking about, you know, the, the budget and stuff. And someone goes, oh, it's all about the money. I went, yes, because without money, we cannot pay our salary. We cannot pay <laughs> the utility. So, and it's, I mean, you hate to say, oh, well, it's about the money. It is, we, because we can't have a school district without it. So thank you so much for managing it and letting us know and doing a great job, Jeanette. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate that. And accounting is not my favorite thing because I am surrounded by accountants, as you know. Yes. I had to take a nap while I was reading the budget. <laughs> my question is, uh, I mean, the, it's not a good picture. I mean, it, it's an okay picture, meaning our three-year look. But when I look from 2014 on, it's just I think that we could have done a better job of planning for this time. And, and I'm... I, I have a minor concern about why our declining enrollment is present because there's there's plenty of other, I've been meeting with some of the private schools for things of mutual concern like uh, the ability to piggyback on our lunch or, you know, we do some, some uh, we do some activities for some of the other schools and those schools have waiting lists for people to get in. In other words, we have classrooms that are empty. We have capacity. I mean, I've diligently looked at the capacity numbers. We have, in some facilities, eight classrooms. I mean, we have a lot of classrooms that are empty. I think that's a, a good statement. And some of the other schools in our region have waiting lists of people to get in. So I know that we keep saying that declining enrollment is a, a cause of people not being able to afford to live in Glendora or whatever that is. But I'm wondering if we could do some kind of data mining that would tell us what some of the root causes of our declining enrollment are or why, why a Glendora family would choose to take a student that is starting TK or kinder or first or whatever to another school besides our public school. I haven't heard any of that in our presentations. And I think that in, in the seat I'm in, that's a viable financial question. What are those schools offering that we're not offering? Or what are the reasons that a parent makes that decision to go to one of the other choices of the schools that they have in our city or in a reasonable proximity to our city? So I'm interested in looking at that. I mean, obviously, I'm interested in helping the district reverse the trend of declining enrollment or understand the trend and and make the budget not be a declining number i mean you have to do something right you just can't keep looking at it since whatever that slide was and say oh we 292 this year oh 250 the next year and you start adding up the numbers and it's a couple thousand students which is a lot so i'm interested in the in the in the gap between some of the other local schools that are that are not public that have waiting lists of waiting for opportunities to get in and we have a ton of capacity and what what we think that is what that nexus is because i would like to be able to attract some of them to come to glendora you know unified school district in some of the programs like the the dual immersion and, and the other the other programs that previous boards have thought to bring that would attract more um students does that make sense? Yes, it does. Because because I, I I just keep hearing talk of the declining enrollment, but I, but I'm not hearing anything to help that other than um, some strategic approaches. So that's my comment on the budget. But we I want to stop that trend. Does that yeah. make sense somehow? Yes, it does make sense. Thank you. I just also uh, want to it say maybe or attract. Uh, more people to come here. No, that's that's really good. I also just kind of want to add that um, as far as the declining enrollment 
is concerned, it's a statewide, it's a statewide issue. We have 80, about 80 to 85 percent of school districts in California experiencing a decline in enrollment. And it's unfortunate that we're part of that, but I agree with you, uh, Mr. President, that, you know, we should definitely look into that and try and attract more students here in our district because we're a great district. It's a great. It's an amazing district. So anyway, thank you. I did, and you kind of answered it. You <laughs> responded with my answer, the answer to my question, which was, as far as declining enrollment, how does it compare to other public yes. schools? Because it's important to compare apples to apples. Um, and I know you're saying 85% of school districts in the state ha are in declining enrollment, but as far as the percentage of declining, do you think we're on par with other schools it's or are on, we dropping more than it's others? It's on par with, uh, with, the, with the average in the state. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments, staff? All right, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I just want to um, lastly thank our fiscal services business department for all their hard work during this time of year. And it's going to get even harder with all of the, the deadlines and everything. And of course, welcome Araceli. I threw her in the fire <laughs> right away, and she, she, she survived. So thank you. <laughs> Then you make a motion for the discussion, and then you you second it, and then you have the discussion. It seems to me a bit presumptuous when you make that motion and second before you even hear the presentation, because the 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 presentation isn't the discussion. The presentation is the presentation, and then the discussion comes from the board. So I'm just asking just for a clarification for me, just for this. Like even if we did it this way for 50 years. To me, it, would you check on that? So we, now that we heard the presentation and we've had a board discussion, we already have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? No. That's good. 5-0. That being said, uh, the meet, oh, we have the consent items. The consent items can be handled all nice together. Try. A nice try. And we have items 8-1 through 11-2. Is there anyone here that wants to pull any of those items? I move approval to blanket approve items eight, whatever you just said. A motion for eight one and eleven two by Reuter. Oh, second. Seconded by. Second. Okay, there we go. We have an motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Okay, so there's another unanimous vote that takes us to the last item which is our adjournment, and I will call this meeting adjourned at 9.29 p.m. Good evening. <laughs>